All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, just present some information that uh, hopefully is new to some of you. Um, the only disclaimers I'm going to give you is that this is going to get a little graphic um, because there was nothing uh, pleasant about the dying process on the cross. You know, we don't uh, televise crucifixions, hangings, firing squads, the more contemporary methods of punishment for capital offenses. But the society at that time made it a um, well-publicized public event, and it was designed to be terrible. Um, and so you don't read a lot about it in the scriptures because it happened every few days. The Romans took people to the cross with some regularity. It was a deterrent against the worst people of society. And so um, we're going to kind of look at that a little bit. Kind of to set the scene, we're going to look at some Old Testament scriptures because it's telling us what's going to happen uh, at, at this time, and the New Testament scriptures that confirm what happened. Remember, the folks leading up this did not have our New Testament. They only had the Old Testament prophecy of what was to come. So they didn't have the foundation we have been blessed to build upon. Um, at this point in time, the, uh, the Passover has just uh, occurred. Jesus has celebrated his third Passover with um, his disciples, his band. Uh, the city has swelled beyond capacity uh, with pilgrims coming to celebrate the Passover. Uh, but at this time, Rome has beefed up security. Again, this time, Palestine is an occupied land under the boot of Rome. Pontius Pilate is, a, uh, is the procurator, the governor of the area. He's come from his beach resort with his troops to reinforce it because Rome doesn't need any trouble. He is a harsh and uh, bitter ruler, for lack of a better word. Uh, he wasn't necessarily well thought of by Rome. He'd been on report because Rome uh, wanted things to be quiet. They wanted the taxes to be funded. They didn't need uh, things stirred up. They didn't want resurrections. They, they didn't want revolt. They didn't want rebellion. They didn't want terrorist acts. Rome wanted it quiet because that kept the stream of... Uh, tax revenue coming to fund the empire. And Pilate had been a very roughshod ruler. He was no friend of the Jews, um, and they, the Jews didn't like Rome. They were arch enemies. Well, the only time they cooperated was to take Jesus to the cross. Um, so at this point in time, Jesus and his, his 11 disciples, the remaining ones, um, we'll, go back, we'll back up a little bit, but have, have now celebrated the Passover supper. They go down and cross the brook Cedron, which is running red with the blood of the sacrificed lambs of the pilgrims that have come, and they ascend to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus knew full well what was to come. His disciples did not have a clue. Um, they had seen many, many things. They'd watch him turn the water into wine. They'd watched him calm the storm. They watched him raise the dead and heal the sick and, and answer the most difficult questions that the leaders had asked for them. And for three years, uh, their faith had been nurtured. And now it was starting to get a little murky. Um, he tells them to pray and steal themselves for what is to come. And with the first scripture, um, it says Mark 14, 37 to 38. Maybe Eric will put that up when he comes back. Um, oh, there it is. Okay. He's way ahead. All right. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He, he put eight of his friends a little bit distant and three, Peter, John, and James, in, as the inner circle, kind of his inner guard. The others were kind of buffer him. And he tells them to get ready, to pray. He says, don't fall into the temptation to def defect, to run away, because it's going to be here. He says, the enemy's not yet here, but he's coming, okay? And Jeremiah had prophesied this in the next scripture. He says, and I like this scripture, if you've raced with the men on foot, and they have reared you. How will you compete with horses? And if in a safe land you are so trusting, what will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? 
what he's telling us, again, this is written years before this, this time, is that the time to prepare, the time to train is in the quiet times when you can deliberate, when you can prepare, when you can uh, get ready. It is said that in medicine or whatever you're doing, you will fall back to your lowest level of training. And that's why we train and we train and we train. So every three months at the hospital, we have to recertify our adult CPR, our pediatric CPR, and all the way how to run the code. We sit through the computer. I did some of mine yesterday. You have to physically pump on the mannequin. You watch the, 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 that you're doing it right. You have to know how to do the airway. Every three months, you renew that stuff. We were doing medic training. We, they, they made sure that we had to do all that stuff, how to put the tourniquets on. Uh, and then they blindfolded you and you did it in the dark room. So you, they wanted you to be able to fall back on something that was automatic. What Jesus is telling his disciples is, you guys need, you've been with me for three years. And he knew he was going to leave them. And he knew the Spirit would come with them. But he wanted them to, to pray, to be ready. Because in a few brief moments, things were going to get pretty difficult for them. And yet, they fell asleep. All right, let's go to Psalm 55, verses 11 to 14. This was written by David 950 years before um, the garden. It said, Ruin is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. For it is not an enemy who taunts me. Then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me. Then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. And of course, Jesus is speaking of his uh, betrayal by Judas Iscariot at the Last Supper. He had um, taken the bread as they reclined at the table. They shared that very special moment in Jewish history. And Judas departed. So they're now in the garden. And it's probably about 1 a.m. Um, he was, again, told his disciples to eight of them to stay there and watch, three to come closer. And he kept going forward, falling down. And the, the, the Greek says it's a repetitive action. He would pray, fall down, pray, fall down. And Dr. Luke describes to us that his uh, sweat was blood, and that there is a medical condition called hemihidrosis, which means basically that under extreme periods of emotional stress, the small blood vessels within the sweat glands can rupture, and the sweat will be like blood. Now, there's no significant blood loss from this. It's more of a, an indicator of the stress that Jesus was under, because he knew what was to come. So it is a described medical condition, and of course, Dr. Luke would pick up that fine detail. Um, now, Gethsemane was a garden that was very much frequented by our Lord. He knew it intimately. And, of course, the people, the Jewish hierarchy, they all knew that he went there. This was no surprise. It was a place where he and his disciples would go and rest and recharge after the long hours of ministry amidst the backdrop of the ancient olive trees with their knurled branches. Um, they offered shade and seclusion in the arid climate for his little band. And the word Gethsemane literally means oil press. And there the olives were squeezed or pressed, where the, the, the halls, which were no good, were extracted the pure part of the oil. And this is a place where Jesus is getting stressed and pressed and could see what he's made out of. It's a, it's a place where he was severely pressured. Uh, it was outside the city limits because the Passover lamb could not be offered within the city limits. Um, and I would kind of submit to you that the real battle, the real battle for Jesus on the cross was in Gethsemane. Once he made that commitment to go to the cross, I think his mind was made up. At Gethsemane, you have all the forces of evil, and those disciples surely felt that damp, evil pressure uh, from the God of this world for them to run, and yet the presence of the Most Holy One, the Son of God. And Jesus felt that on his back because he was both God and man, and so he felt this intense pressure. He knew it was to come. He knew that death was 
the, the cross was a horrible way to die. And the human part of him really wanted to go somewhere else. But the divine part of him wanted to honor the will of the Father. And if you go back from Genesis 3.15 on up, everything points to this moment, the coming of the cross. But the battle, I think, not, did not occur during his trials, during his um, crucifixion, but rather in the garden. Like that's when he had to decide what to do. <clears throat> All the forces of the universe were on his back. And he decided at that moment what to do. Remember, centuries ago, the first Adam, Paul writes of the first and second Adam, Adam and Eve lost the battle in the garden, and they were thrown out of paradise. This time, the second Adam that Paul writes about makes the decision to open paradise back up. So the real pressure of the eons is on him spiritually and emotionally. No wonder he sweat blood. <clears throat> and so let's go to the uh, fulfillment, Matthew 14. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, that's the one that's betraying that uh, uh, Zechariah told us going to happen, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and scribes and elders, now the betrayer had given him a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. <clears throat> now, it's kind of a... At this point in time, he's forsaken by the disciples. Let's go a little further in the Scripture to... Um, Zechariah, awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. Centuries before Jesus and his band ascended to that bleak Mount of Olives, the garden, Zechariah knew what was going to happen. You can almost put yourself in that picture, close your eyes, and you can, he, you can it's, it's one in the morning, Jesus is in earnest prayer, his disciples are sleeping, and suddenly up the hill, you hear the clank of Roman armor. You can see the flickering torchlight. You can smell the soot from the torches and the, the clamor of the group that's coming. At this time... Again, Pilate came down from Caesarea, where his beach home was. He beefed up the security. And it's interesting, if you read who he assigned to this group, it was not a centurion or a leader of 100, but a chiliarch, which is over 600 soldiers. So they beefed things up. This was a big deal. The, the Passover was a big deal. So the commanding officer was a higher ranking than uh, just simply a centurion. Peter had proclaimed his loyalty, but fear ruled that night. And his inner circle uh, fled to him, from him as the troops advanced. And it's interesting how the Romans divide, the, 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 the knights divide into four sections of watches. And so you can kind of figure how that is. And at the beginning of that watch, if you read about the, 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 the cock crowing, I don't think that's a rooster, just as an aside. When they changed the guard, the soldier would blow that trumpet and during the Passover, he would blow it both directions twice to notify all as well. That was a change of watch. And when Peter heard that, I don't think it was a rooster because those animals were not supposed to be in Jerusalem. They were uh, considered unholy. So that changing of the guard was called the cock crow. That was the term that the Romans used. Every, every three hours, they would, they would announce that and change that so they would make sure that their, their centurions their security, everybody's around. He would stand up and blow that galadium, which is a horn, both directions. And usually he'd blow it once, but during Passover, he blew it twice. So Jesus told <coughs> Peter before the cock crow, which is the name that they use for that <coughs> transition, that he would deny him. And that's indeed what happened. So that's a little historical tidbit for you. So what does Matthew have to say in verse 26? He says, but all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And we're kind of building that case because, again, they did not have our New Testament. 
Then all the disciples left him and fled. <clears throat> they are out of there. Now, make no mistake, our Lord had the authority and the ability to call 12 legions of angels to his rescue. One would have been sufficient when Sennacherib was visited by the one angel, 120 soldiers lay dead by the time the night had lifted. But he chose not to. We suspect that there were roughly 200 soldiers coming up that hill. That was a lot for 11 guys, but they were expecting maybe problems. And part of those were Roman soldiers uh, from the lowest rank on up. They wore armor, shields, um, almost all the things we read about in Ephesians 6. Part of those were the temple guard. Again, Palestine was an occupied land. It says the king was staged. The temple guards couldn't use, uh, they didn't allow them to be armed. They weren't allowed to have swords. They had clubs. They knew how to use them very well. Uh, but So you've got a mix of Jewish temple guards and Roman soldiers. They never cooperated until now. And that group is who ascended. And But look who's in control. Our next scripture. Now, Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place where Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, you've got a mixed contingent, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. That part of Scripture is often, I think, overlooked. Our Lord speaks the word, and the Greek is ego emii, the same ego emii that used to meet with the first Adam in the garden. It's the same ego emii that met Moses at the burning bush in the desert. I am that I am. I am he. He spoke those words, and those soldiers are flat on their back. They have no idea what happened. They knew there was something very powerful in front of them. And he didn't have to go with them, but he chose to go with them. He was in control. This was what he came for. This was his mission. This was his destiny. And he voluntarily gave himself as the Lamb of God. So make no mistake, they did not take him by force. They didn't have enough force. They took him because he allowed them to take him. He was fully in control of what was going to happen. All right, let's go to Isaiah 50, verses 5 and 6. And we'll see what the prophet writes some 900 years prior to this event. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. What does Matthew tell us actually happened in Verse 26, he says, go to the next scripture. And then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him. Exactly what Zechariah or Isaiah told us was going to happen. And then Matthew writes these words in verse 20, uh, in chapter 27. Then they released him, then they released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Okay? <clears throat> and so we're at that point where he has been confronted in the garden. He, he voluntarily goes. His disciples flee. And he starts getting abused from that time. Now, as, a, as an aside, if you look at the six trials that Jesus went to, three of them before the uh, Jewish authorities and three of them before the Roman authorities, every single legal precedent was broken. The Sanhedrin never met at night. There was no room for violence in the courtroom. The innocent had the right of appeal. When In cases of capital punishment, the Jewish Sanhedrin had to uh, 
sleep overnight and think about it. And the youngest had to vote before the oldest. They all voted at once. They knew he was guilty. There was no debate. So every single thing in this sacred law that the Jews had was cast out the window because the verdict was decided before the lamb showed up. If you look at the Roman side, Pilate freely says, I find no doubt in this man. They had to have um, very, the Roman code was very explicit about um, trials and what occurred, and none of that was respected either. The blows and the spitting went against both of those rules. There was no abuse allowed until the uh, victim was to be found guilty. And all of this happened in front of the high priest. And yet no trial had yet pronounced his guilt. Now, the practice of scourging was widespread. And now we need to come to the first picture. Now, this is when it gets a little bit more graphic. Um, the victim uh, for the scourging was basically strapped to a short post. He was stripped naked because there was not to be any kind of dignity this process of uh, dying for your crimes. Crucifixion is a, is a crime that was reserved only for the worst of the worst. It was for soldiers who had uh, deserted. That's the only Roman that could be crucified. Paul wasn't crucified, he was beheaded. Roman law prohibited crucifixion for any Roman citizen. It was for murderers, it was for terrorists, deserters. That was it. And it was done publicly in the most humiliating way. Um, and it, it just, but it was very common because Rome wanted to display their power. So the practice of scourging was designed to weaken the victim. And they call it, it was almost worse than death. So the victim was stripped, was tied to a post with his arms outstretched. So he had no choice about what he could do. Um, the lictor stood with a whip, a flagellum. And in this flagellum, there were uh, small pieces of metal balls, lead balls, and bone or glass or ceramic tied to the leather. And the lictor would stand from the side and strike the victim repeatedly, okay? And, and trust me, he was very good at what he did. He was practiced. He knew how to extract the pain and the blood. And these balls would actually hit and bruise the tissue. And if you look at where the... Um, muscles and the vessels run in the human body. In the back, they run vertically, okay? And he would strike at an angle. So he would sever the muscle, sever the arteries. The whole idea was to tear things up a lot. And there would be huge amounts of blood loss. So these balls would wrap around, strip off pieces of the flesh covering the ribs. Um, it was not unusual for the kidneys to be exposed. I mean, it was just a terrible um, process. So the Jews limited the uh, scourging to 39 lashes because they did not think that anybody could stand more than that. But the Romans had no such respect. And each, with each blow, more tissue damage would occur and more and more blood loss would occur. So the victim had, to, had no choice but be hung there and he took a terrible beating with terrible pain. Again, the nerves and the arteries run vertically and those were all severed lacerated, there were internal organs hanging out, and if the centurion did too much, the victim would die if he didn't stop it soon enough. So he took him just to the point of death, and the blood loss was tremendous. So by this time, the victim is in, we call it hypovolemic shock. He had lost so much blood that, you know, if we were trying to resuscitate him, the first thing we'd do is start pumping fluids and blood into to resuscitate. So uh, his blood pressure's down, his, he's thirsty, he's in terrible shock, and um, this is a precursor to the cross. And it's almost worse than death, some victims say. Some, and it's just a terrible process, this scourging. So Old Testament Scripture tells us what's to come. Our gospel writers tell us exactly what happened to Jesus. And he went there voluntarily. All right, so in the meantime, let's see what happened with Judas and Zechariah. I think we had that Scripture Zechariah uh, 11, 12, 13. Says, and then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed up as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Now that's the price of a slave, by the way. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. 
the lordly price at which I priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. And basically, Judas gave his money back because he realized his political aspirations, his financial aspirations to get in the money bag, he, by turning Jesus over, didn't get him what he wanted. He wanted Jesus to physically become a uh, ruler and to cause the revolt, to take and throw Rome out. Well, none of that happened. He could begin to see that. So he took the money back, and the... the uh, the authorities took the money because it was blood money because it, would, it bought the blood and he hanged himself and then they bought that potter's field just as Zacharias said was going to happen centuries before. It's all there. And then Psalm 69 verse 21 tells us, they gave me poison for food and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Again, when was this written? 950 years before the event we're studying. David, and if you look at the Psalms of Richard, this particularly Psalm 22, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, recorded what was going to happen in this book. And how could he know? It was obviously under the, the authorship or the editorship of the Holy Spirit. There was a cheap wine that the soldiers drank, uh, and it was mixed with gall. It was offered as an anesthetic to the victim uh, to be crucified, to help kind of numb the pain. And Jesus initially declined it, uh, because he, he didn't want to, but he, if you look later in Scripture, he did um, take that step so that Scripture would be fulfilled just before he died. Turning to Psalm 22, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers and circles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Again, 950 years before the event, David writes what's going to happen. In Psalm 22, you could almost paint the whole picture of the crucifixion from this. Um, we'll turn to the next picture here. Uh, the Persians invented crucifixion. The, uh, Alexander the Great brought it uh, from Persia in his conquest. If you read Daniel, you'll see how that all takes place. He brought that technology back in Rome perfected it, okay? It was the worst possible death. It prolonged suffering like no other. There are stories of the victims being on the cross for up to nine days, and you can see how this is going to get really difficult. Again, the gospel writers don't tell us much about the process because they saw it every week. It was not new to them. The, the, the victims were crucified. They were often left on the cross for the, the bodies to rot, the birds to pick the flesh off, as a reminder to other people, hey, if you're going to be a terrorist, you're going to end up like that guy. So Rome advertised that very well. Um, the victim is already nearly dead from the scourging. And the severity of the scourging or the beating that you took with those cat of nine tails and the lead balls and the strips of bone that ripped your flesh apart, the amount of blood loss depended how long you survived on the cloth. Cross. The more severe the beating, the less metabolic reserve you had to try and keep your air going on the cross. So Jesus must have taken a particularly severe scourging because he didn't only last for nine hours on the cross. Um, again, it's a penalty reserved for the worst of the worst. And with great efficiency, these soldiers knew how to do it. The crucifixion brigade knew very well what they were doing. They, you know, they, they, uh, had scourged him there. Again, he was probably naked. He, they, if you see before Pilate, they threw that robe on that purple robe. It wasn't a robe that you and I imagine that goes to the floor. It's more like a shawl, just covered his shoulders. They put the, the long three-inch thorns that they used to start fires. They just went over and grabbed some of those. It was their kindling wood and stuck it in his head. That's where they, um, they caused him to have more pain and suffering. And they, they, basically nailed him very efficiently. If you look at the wrist, and in ancient literature, the wrist is, um, so, they, so they basically they tied the cross member or the patibulum. This is probably the kind of cross that Jesus was nailed to. We think of the, the cross we see on our pendants more like this, but in reality, the victim was so weak he could only carry that first upper member. It was about a 75-pound weight. And Jesus was so weak he couldn't carry even the full 
walk in La Vida Del Rosa, and they had to get Simon of Cyrene to help him. Um, so they, they had beaten him, they tied him, he had a sign in front of him which had his crime written in the three languages of the era so that all would know what happened to him. And so he, he struggled, he fell. Again, his flesh is like ribbons of muscle now. And they managed to take him to the um, <clears throat> place, Golgotha, the place of the skull. Um, the, we call it the Calvary, or Calvarium is the bones of the skull. And look at the next photo here. And they throw him down on the ground. And so that says they pierced him. And so the nails were some five inch long wooden Roman nails. And they pierced the hands. They don't pierce the hands here, they pierce the wrist here. Okay? There, there's not enough tissue for the man to be suspended by this part of the hand. And in, in, the, in, the, in the Roman and uh, Hebrew language, wrist or hand is all the way from here on up. So where they drove the nails was right here. And so anatomically, if you look where these spikes went, what goes right through here? Your carpal tunnel. Okay, that's the carpal tunnel syndrome. So this nerve provides both sensation and uh, motor function to these three digits, the first three and half of this one. So once that nail, uh, the, the soldier would throw them down very quickly. He would lean on his outstretched arm with the um, knee, take that big wooden mallet and quickly drive that nail through the bones of the wrist. And he knew exactly where to go in that little notch because no, you're not going to break any bone. The Passover lamb never got any bones broken. But the nerve was severed. As soon as that happened, that part of the hand no longer worked. The other thing as soon as that happens, you've got raw nerve endings on cold steel. And the pain was unimaginable. Um, they were careful to not stretch the arms too tight because if they did, he couldn't pull himself up as much. And then they did a similar process with the feet. Um, they bent the knees in a very awkward, uncomfortable position. Um, we can flip to the next slide. I think that's new. So they flipped the, uh, the, the they host, put the knees in a very uncomfortable position and I don't think we got any up there yet. But the, the soldiers were very careful. If they bent the knees, if they kept the knees too straight, the victim couldn't bend himself to push up, and he died too quickly. So um, they were careful to bend them in a very awkward position with one foot over the other, and they drove that nail through um, the feet. Um, and and uh, they had him in it stretched out, and his, he, was, he had just enough room to push. But if he kept them too straight, he didn't last long enough. They, had, they, were, they knew how to do this. They had done it a lot. Okay? Mark um, tells us that uh, in Mark 15, here, here we go. So they bit, back up one just a second here. Sorry about that. We're going to leave this one. Okay. We, we can go either way. So, so when they, they, had to, they drove these nails here, they had to bend the legs just right. The arms were bent just right so that the victim had to push up. The chest was a very contorted, inefficient method for uh, moving air. And one of the things that you have to think about is our breathing pattern. And we'll get to this in just a moment. But when, when we inhale, we don't think about it. We actually breathe in. Exhalation is passive. You don't think about blowing the air out unless you're running a race or something like that. Well, when you're on the cross... Everything is outstretched. You can't exhale. You have to push up to push the air out. It's a very backwards, inefficient, unphysiologic method of breathing. So every breath is a struggle. It's a terrible struggle. So those seven utterances from the cross that Jesus made, there were his throat is dry like a potsherd. He's trying to get a little bit of air out, and he, he tries seven times to give us the message, and he does. Um, from this very, very awkward and uncomfortable position. But that's the kind of position you would have seen the victim on. The, the sign, the titulus with the title of his crime would be above his head. The soldiers would be at the feet, the crowd out here watching. And um, 
So the first thing you notice is that when they lift that cross member up and put it up here, the first thing you notice is terrible pain in his wrist and his feet because now those nerves and, and tissue are suspending his, the weight of his body as it wants to fall forward off the cross. Sometimes they would actually put a little seat on here to kind of make him last a little longer. Not always. They don't think they did that in Jesus' era frequently. So you've got severe searing pain in the extremities. The hands don't work anymore. The toes don't work. But the pain is unimaginable. The next thing he notices is he's suffocating. There's no air exchange. He cannot breathe at all. So each breath has to be uh, that overwhelming need to breathe. He will push these knees, uh, legs up, pull up with his hands against these raw nerves, take that breath, and sag back down. And this process goes on for hours and hours. Now, understand, he's also lost blood. He's lost fluids. <clears throat> the worst Charlie horses imaginable are happening as he's trying to do this because the muscles are screaming in agony, like he's just run a long-distance race and they've got no fuel to do it. And with each breath, his back is a lacerated ribbon of flesh. It's grating on that cross. The birds and the insects are taking their toll. The crowd is jeering at him. His physiology is winding down. He's going into heart failure. Um, he's suffocating. Um, <clears throat> Mark in 15, 23, 26, you don't have to turn to the right. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the, assertion, the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. Pilate, that was the traditional, the, the victim of crucifixion always had his crime written on that titulus or the sign. The Jews didn't like that. He's not the king of the Jews, but he said he was the king of the Jews. Pilate says, what I've written stays written. And that message, the king of the Jews, was in all three languages, you know, Greek, uh, Aramaic, and uh, Latin, so that all would know what his crime was. So the, vic the victim gets weaker and weaker in this process. Psalm 22, verse 14, 15 writes, I am poured out like water, again, 950 years before the cross, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. He's dehydrated. He is so thirsty. You've all been thirsty on a hike and not been able to get water. He is thirst beyond imagination. The body is screaming for fluids, for blood, for metabolic reserve, and none are to be offered. All he can experience is muscle cramps and a continued struggle to get that next breath of air, which causes him great pain. All right, John 19, we'll flip there. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar, a jar of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And each utterance from the cross took great effort. Each attempt at to utter a few words is not a, a we talk. It's one of those things where He's so, with so much effort to say these few things that he thought was important. And he didn't curse the people that were cursed, but he asked forgiveness. So it's this terrible thing. Um, he, he's finished. And he's, the word's finished in the Greek is tetelestai, you translated. It means paid in full. The best analogy I can give you is once in a while I get stuck going to the grocery store, which I don't do very well. And if I have to get a gallon of milk, they'll stick a sticker on there that says paid. That paid in full is what he's proclaiming. He has paid the price. It's not, I am finished. It's, it is finished. The plan of God is finished now that he's went to the cross and is going to give up his spirit. And he does. He gives up his spirit and, and releases himself. And before he does that, he, he does take that last sip of gall from the hyssop branch that they offered him because that was part of fulfillment and psalm 31 says you take me out um, of the net they have hidden from me for you are my refuge and into my hand i commit my spirit you have redeemed me O lord faithful god so just as david predicted he commits himself to the 
to the Father. And we talk about the horrible physical things that happen on the cross, and they're horrible. And it, and I, it, but the other thing we don't probably fully understand, God the Son has never been apart from God the Father. This is the first and only time in all eternity that Father and Son are torn apart because a holy God cannot be part of sin. Jesus took my sin, your sin, the sin of the world on himself on that cross, and God turned his back on him when he was on the cross. So not only was he in that great physical pain, God turned his back on him, his son, for the first and only time because he was sin. He now had that spiritual void because he did no longer have the presence of his father. Well, that may have hurt just as much as the physical. Jesus, the son, was rejected by men and now forsaken by God. Isaiah tells us that's going to happen in verse 53. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquity. So this was God's plan, okay? He fulfilled that prophecy. He committed his spirit. He was separated. And he cried that that tell us by which means paid in full. And at that moment, something very interesting is recorded as happening in Scripture. Remember what it was? The curtain in the temple was ripped from top to bottom. It was as thick as your palm is this way. It was some it took, it was like 20 by 60 feet. It took a whole army of priests to hang that thing, and it just ripped from the top to the bottom. Behind that curtain was the most holy place where the atoning sacrifice was offered. The high priest was allowed to come there once per year. Out here you had the holy place, then the most holy place, and then you had the, the uh, court of the Jews, and the court of the Gentiles, and the court of the women. Nobody went in there but once a year. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. Well, the perfect sacrifice was offered. So the barrier between man and God was ripped from top to bottom by what Jesus did on the cross. And they record that in Scripture for us. We now have a high priest that makes our intercession on the highest order. There was never a reason for another lamb to die because the Lamb of God paid the price. Let's go to Numbers 9.12. <clears throat> And this is, again, talking to the Passover, a very sacred event in uh, the Old Testament. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any of its bones according to all the statue. For the Passover, they shall keep it. So the Passover lamb could not have any bones broken. Now we'll put that into the last picture, I think, the last drawing there where they, there we go, okay. So when the victim was on the cross, he could, go, he could hang there for hours. But the Romans knew that if they either put their legs too straight, they could speed it up. But if they had a party to go to, or in this case, Passover and the, and the uh, Pilate didn't want any trouble with the Jews, the Jews came and said, okay, end this stuff. We've got to get these guys off the cross because some of the powerful guys in the Passover or the Sanhedrin like uh, Nicodemus said, this is, this is gone on enough, he's already dead. They could, finish, they could finish the crucifixion very quickly. They took a big, and this gets really brutal again, I'm sorry, but this is just what it was. They took a big wooden hammer and they would break the legs of the victim. And this was done almost in every case to make sure they were dead. They would break the legs, they could no longer push themselves up, they would suffocate very quickly. So if you read what happened in Scripture, they broke the legs of both thieves so they would suffocate quickly and get off the cross before the Passover. They came to Jesus they didn't break any bones because Scripture says it's not going to happen. They did not need the hammer, the crew fragment is called, to make him suffocate very quickly because he was already dead. He'd already committed himself to Jesus. John 19.31 tells us exactly what happens. We'll back up and then come back to this one. Since it was the day of the preparation... And so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, 
for that was a high Sabbath day, the Passover, the Jews asked Pilate that the legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. <clears throat> And that's, uh, you know, that's not what the Romans did. But they didn't break Jesus' legs. So back up to that last photo. But they also wanted to make absolutely sure that these criminals, these insurrectionists, these terrorists were graveyard dead. So the Romans were very good in the use of armor. They used these swords and spears with great efficiency. They trained all the time. They'd seen it on the battlefield. They always aim for the chest and the heart. And they were good at doing it on the battlefield with a guy with a shield who's fighting back. It's a piece of cake when you got a guy fast to a cross. So the soldier took the sword and he ran it, or the spear, and he ran it up through Jesus' right side and into the back and into the heart. That's where they aimed for. And John tells us that blood and water came out uh, because these guys were good at what they did. By this time, Jesus was in hypovolemic shock. His heart had started to fail. The sack around the heart of the pericardium had filled up with some fluid and some blood, and he's gotten fluid on this part of the lung. We call that a pleural effusion. So when the soldier pierced that, this fluid is kind of clear, pure sanguine, straw-colored fluid. This fluid is blood red. The blood and the water came out, just as we would expect physiologically. All right, let's go to Isaiah chapter 53. Watch the clock closely here. <clears throat> Isaiah writes for us, And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. So the process has happened very quickly in six hours. Um, that Friday, Good Friday. Jesus is dead, he's been crucified, he's been pierced. And Joseph of Arathema, a powerful man, Nicodemus, who was probably the second richest man in the city, came and approached Pilate and says, we've got to get this, this process over. The Passover's coming. That Sabbath starts in the evening. We can't leave anybody on a cross for the Sabbath. So Pilate made sure he was dead. He was a little surprised that Jesus died that quickly. And they took the body of our Lord and they had to act quickly. And they anointed it with, um, yeah, so, yeah, so after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Christ, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, he needed some help. You can't bury that body by yourself. Uh, also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. That 75 pounds is the weight of those spices for a king. Common people didn't get 75 pounds. These rich men gave him a kingly burial. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in the linen cloth and the spices that is a burial custom of the Jews. Now in a place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, a new tomb, which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, so the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. This wasn't all likelihood. The tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, he was a rich man. The, the burial process for the Jews, it was arid country. So they would take the body, wrap it in these strips of cloth, and then put this rich myrrh and aloe, which is very uh, aromatic. They would give you like a paste and form like a cast almost over the body. They would, and except for the face, and they would put the napkin over that. They took the body then, and they put it in a tomb that was not used, the rich man's tomb. It was a huge, there's all kind of natural caves. This was close, the Sabbath is coming, it's, it's, he owns it. So they take the body of Jesus, they put it in the, the uh, tomb. And the, the tomb is uh, called the Mithra. It's, uh, it's, it, it has like probably nine shells all around the side, but you've got one for the opening, nine shells. And the shelves are called the kook, and the tomb is called the place where you spend the night. And the roll of this big 2,000-pound two, stone, which has already got a groove uh, uh, or a trench, 
They take the rock and they roll it downhill to seal the tomb. So nature seals the tombs. And that's where they buried Jesus. Well, that's not enough for the Jews and the Romans. So Pilate comes along and he blows a smaller stone uh, on top of the Galil stone. And then he takes this signet ring that he gives to his soldiers. They melt some wax and they stamp his seal in that wax. So nature has sealed, gravity has sealed the tomb. Roman law has sealed the tomb. He posted a guard that sealed the tomb, just in deference to the authorities. So we've got Jesus who is dead physiologically. He is dead to Rome legally. He is dead to nature by the tomb. And at this point in time, I think Satan laughs because he thinks, I got him at last. And you ask yourself, why? Why did our Lord knowingly do all this stuff? And I think going to our last scripture, or the next to the last scripture, common one that everybody knows this one, John 3, 16. Nicodemus, the, the fellow who came to Jesus by night, I think he had to ponder what Jesus has told him that conversation in the past. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes him should not perish but have eternal life. I think Nicodemus started to get the light to come on because he had defiled himself by doing this. He was going to get kicked out of Sanhedrin. Um, he was done as far as his political power. But he understood that he had just anointed the king of kings and lord of lords. I think Nicodemus began to try and figure this out. Nicodemus knew the Jewish law. And Joseph, they, they were experts. They were leading lawyers of their time. So he's pondering that as he looks at that stone. And old S.M. Lockridge, the black preacher of the late 60s, he, he tells us, Things look pretty bleak by Sunday's coming. And Isaiah writes for us, For your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. Who will dwell in the dust? Awake, sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Three days later, that stone was rolled away. The soldiers were passed out in fear. The stone was rolled away by the angels not to let Jesus out. It was to show us that he was no longer there. Mankind now had before them this brutal fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrifice, which was predicted through all the time to centuries, even through David's time from Adam's time, to this pivotal break point in history of the cross, of the Garden of Gethsemane. And going forward, we had the Lamb of God, because he paid the price. And so you look at this terrible, brutal process, and I know it was graphic. I can't make it not graphic. It was meant to be graphic. That's what our Savior did for us to pay the price for our redemption. It was a very high, pray, high price to be paid by the perfect Lamb of God. So as you go through this week of thinking about Palm Sunday and the Passover and uh, Good Friday, I hope that this at least gives you a little more flavor of what it, my best interpretation of what it was really like for our Lord as he contemplated what lay before him. So let's pray and I'll take some questions. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to look at this difficult, difficult passage, this difficult physiologic process of death on the cross. We know that you had planned it from the beginning, that your word tells us fully well what was to come, and that your son was willing to pay the ultimate terrible price for our redemption. And we are thankful that Sunday is coming. So Lord, as we go forward, help us to ponder those things in our heart this week. In Jesus' name, amen.